Greg. Um, thanks everybody again for being here. If I could, I would love to share with Dorothy right now a lovely uh, plaque for um, her, her presentation and a poster of her talk. Um, we'll be shipping those in the mail. So watch out if for a package from us, it's legit. Um, okay, so I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Dorothy Espelage to present at our 19th annual Bennett Lecture in Prevention Science. This was established through the generosity of our benefactor, Edna Bennett Pierce. Dr. Espelage is William C. Friday, Distinguished Professor of Education at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And her research focuses on translating empirical findings into prevention and intervention programming. Here are just a few examples. She has edited six books and written more than 190 peer reviewed articles and 70 chapters on bullying, homophobic teasing, sexual harassment, dating violence, and gang violence. She advises policymakers on bullying prevention legislation and conducts regular webinars for the CDC, the NIH, and the National Institute of Justice, NIJ. Dorothy has authored a 2011 White House brief on bullying among LGBTQ youth and attended the White House conference in 2011. Uh, she has appeared on many television news and talk shows as well, and has been quoted in national print publications, such as Time Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, and USA Today. And she has secured more than $12 million in funding for her work. She has received numerous awards, including the Prevention Science Award from the Society for Prevention Research, and the American Psychological Association's Lifetime Achievement Award in Prevention Science. Dorothy, thank you so much for joining us. On behalf of all of us, we're grateful to have your time today. And I know there are two follow-up events tomorrow that we'll mention later. And so welcome and we'll um, sit back and enjoy your talk. Thank you. Great, Great. thank you very much. Um, I'm quite honored, although there's some pressure here given it's the first virtual um, <laughs> webinar for the center. Uh, one honor just to be invited um, by the center, a center that I follow the work and have been inspired by the work that's come out of the center for the last couple of decades. And just honored to be um, named a Bennett lecture. And I looked at the past recipients and it was humbling to, to see um, who's done this talk before me. Um, I wish I were there. I wish we were on a plane to get to you, but we will just work with this. Um, again, if there's any pressing questions, I've become quite well-versed in um, given webinars and looking at the chat function. So I want to just preface this that we have just an hour together and there will be other events tomorrow for a potential follow-up. Um, and I'm in the middle of writing this 10 year review on bullying for the Journal of Research and Adolescence. And in the last 10 years, there have been 1800 articles written on bullying um, globally. So I, I'm just going to give you little nuggets of the work that we've done as well as others in the field to hopefully by the end of this hour shape um, your understanding of, of bullying and the concomitant school violence, um, things that we look at is that it's very complex and um, we have to think about um, all of the pieces that come together to, um, to try to prevent school violence and bullying. Um, as I am heavily funded by CDC and NIJ, these are my disclaimers and anything I say in the next 55 minutes or my opinion, my interpretations and not necessarily those of my funders. And so it's, it's always, um, I always want to remind folks that as much as I'm sitting here and presenting 25 years worth of research, um, there's lots of things I'm not going to be able to talk about, but also um, I represent 40 PhD students that some are now full professors in the field um, addressing bullying and other forms of gender-based harassment in K through 12 settings um, and thousands upon thousands of undergrads. Um, and I know there's a number of UNC undergrads um, that I'm mentoring now that are on that that are on this webinar. Um, but I think some of this work that, I, that I'm going to talk about is very challenging within K through 12 settings. And so this work has only been done because of supportive school administrators, superintendents, principals, and teachers that allow us to come in, and parents, I would say, allow us to come in and ask some hard questions um, to really get after these things that we um, care about. 
The other thing is when I started this work in 1993, there were five articles written in the United States on bullying. And I just said in the last 10 years, there's 1800. So that's a lot of work to do in 1993 when I started this work. The five articles were largely written in special education. And so um, there's lots of work that I'm not going to be able to cover. So if someone is of the 80 participants, if I didn't cite your work, I apologize. I'm doing the best I can. Um, there's a lot out there. And for those of you that don't necessarily study bullying and haven't read the now 4,000 articles that are out there that come out every day, every hour, I'm going to try to walk you through just some basic um, things that, we're, that we've struggled with in the area of bullying prevention and school violence more broadly. Um, and, but know that we're not gonna go in depth. This was a class that I taught for 15 weeks at the University of Illinois. So we're going to just talk about um, just the tip of the iceberg, if you will. This PowerPoint will also be available. So don't feel like you need to write down all these citations. Um, and we've covered a lot of areas. What's also important is every, and it, folks know this, that when we started doing the interviews in 1993 with middle school students trying to understand how the research in say Europe was applicable to the US context, it raised many, many research questions about bullying and um, the associated school violence indicators. And so I'm just gonna give you some sampling of that. Now you heard Stephanie say that I wrote this piece in 2011 for the White House. It was the first White House conference on bullying. Um, and this is under the Obama administration. What it did was it highlighted that bullying is a unique form of youth aggression that may, the mechanisms, the mediators, the moderators, the underpinning ideological factors may be different. But what it also did was there was a huge media hype, bullying prevention became hyper-commercialized. Um, and at that point, um, school districts were purchasing programs that had no evidence base or purchasing programs that had evidence based outside of the United States. Um, and in some cases there, the science was not being heard. So around that time, I created this slide that has just kind of gone with me for all of my talks. And this is a class in and of itself. So I'm just going to give you some sense that although bullying is a public health crisis and a concern, it's not an epidemic in some of our schools. So there are some schools that we're in where kids are having a really good experience. Um, and that's just not part of their climate and culture. Um, there is also this notion, unfortunately, um, that bullying is uh, causally linked to suicide. It absolutely is not true, but bullying is a very strong, potent predictor in the meta-analysis that folks have done over the last um, decade. Uh, but there is no causal link, which means that there are things that we can do to minimize the connection and association between bullying involvement, both for perpetrators and victims, and suicide outcomes. And we're starting to do some really good work in that space. Um, there's also a notion that somehow that there's just one type of ineffective aggressor or bully that is a budding criminal. Um, and the reality is, is that there's heterogeneity in those kids that engage in high rates of bullying. So Tom Farmer and Tracy Valancourt have talked about the Machiavellian bully. Um, in England, they've talked about bullies uh, in, kids that engage in high rates of bullying actually having a heightened theory of mind and be able to read the environment such that they can pick out victims that are less likely to have social capital or to have bystanders take, stick up for them. Um, so there's great heterogeneity and we are mostly learning um, from other countries that have studied this phenomenon longitudinally that chronic victimization certainly is associated with um, mental disorders, if you will, and and to adulthood, but those that engage in those behaviors, the perpetrators actually just have antisocial traits, but not full blown um, mental health issues. So a lot of work that, that needs to be done there, but certainly we do know that the victims that are chronically victimized um, are at greatest risk for suicide, unfortunately over time. Um, there, in the beginning of this discussion, almost now, 27 years ago, there was a notion that we just needed to um, three strikes you're out, zero tolerance uh, for this behavior. And as we started to uncover that bullying really is a symptom of a larger social climate issue, uh, we've pulled back from there. 
Um, it also, that approach, which many districts and states went with that approach of just because parents drove this, right? Why are these bullies not being suspended and expelled? It really does ignore the fact um, that in developmental science for many decades, bullying has been conceptualized as a group phenomenon where kids play different roles dating back to Salma Belli's 1991 classic paper through the 1996 papers of Nikki Crick and others. Um, there's also this notion that bullies, and these are all kind of myths and misperceptions that are in the field that pervade. And some of you might have these perceptions as well. I certainly hear, it, hear them from parents. I hear these from teachers. Um, one lovely saying is apples don't far, fall far from the tree. And this is this notion that a kid that engaged in high rates of bullying, um, they will think about the parents that may be upset in the office. Again, with the heterogeneity of bullying, we know that some kids where there's not violence in the home may engage in these behaviors if that's supported in a school context. So even good kids, well-meaning kids, I've been in Catholic uh, schools where they have the highest rates of bullying, um, can get involved in bullying because of the climate and the pressure to fit in and go along with the cool kids, if you will. Um, the next one is this idea that bullying is hardwired. And this came out of a Canadian study that was cross-sectional where they concluded and the press picked it up that bullying is hardwired and that we can't necessarily change this. Um, I would point everybody to the Canadians also work, Tremblay and others, and Meyer Brigden of the environment matters and this idea that you could have a genetic predisposition toward aggression, but it's not gonna manifest itself unless that classroom or that school um, supports that. So the environment by gene, really that interaction matters. And then finally, 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 with some meta-analysis that I'm gonna to point to um, later in the talk, um, it has been well established that if you simply have a school assembly um, with no follow-up, with no strategic plan of how to address bullying across the school and across the stakeholders, that the school assemblies can simply um, be ineffective and contribute to iatrogenic effects. Um, and so I often encourage schools to, yes, see the school assembly as something that should be engaging such that kids are paying attention, but see it as just the launch to a larger initiative to address bullying. So um, one way, this is one way in which I'm trying to uh, instill this idea um, based on the meta-analysis that I'll speak to, that it's really complex to think about effective bullying and violence prevention. Um, and we do know that uh, policies and procedures, whether it's the PBIS framework, the MTSS framework, um, hat is a strong foundation. And, and certainly the PBIS adaptation for bullying prevention has yielded reductions modestly. The, the story is gonna be modest when we think about reductions in effect sizes. There's a growing recognition, and um, since the Durlac 2011, that was a good year for us, um, meta-analysis that showed that schools, kids that were exposed to social emotional training and learning um, consistently uh, were less disruptive in the classroom. Um, and so there's an increasing focus on social emotional competence. Some of you might call this executive function, depending on the state that you're in. Um, you know, or uh, workforce development as well. But these are all the skills and competencies that kids need to navigate um, school, academic, and social interactions. But at the same time, um, building those skills to, to matriculate as they go through the K through 12 um, system. In the area of bullying prevention, for many decades, we focused largely on the, the children um, and less on the adults in the building. Uh, at one point, maybe in the early 2000s, there was three papers written on teachers, attitudes related to bullying prevention. There's been a growing body of literature. Um, Wendy Troop Gordon, Patricia Hawley, Hawley, all of these others are starting to talk about um, this idea that we can't just promote these social competencies in the kids without uh, attending to the training of the, the staff. Um, and increasingly, we are recognizing that um, the adults in the building may need to address some social emotional skill deficits themselves. And so there is a push even in IES to fund professional development around bullying prevention, which we're currently engaged in for all staff, which needs to be consistent over time. 
Um, so we could spend a lot of time talking about the definition in 2014. Um, the Centers for Disease Control convened um, some researchers internationally to come together. Like many countries, the United States adopted Dan Olveus's definition um, out of Norway, uh, which is a brilliant definition, and, but we never really tested it empirically to see if these components that he talked about of real or perceived power repeated or has a high likelihood of being repeated um, was really salient um, in this definition to make it different than other forms of aggression or conflict between peers. Several years working on that task force, um, the, the bolded is important. So there seems to be this notion that there has to be a power imbalance, um, but it's not always measurable. So we modified and said it has to be real or perceived. Um, and it was also important for, my, for us to modify the number two here uh, based on developmental science. And this is this idea that when kids are victimized through bullying, they actually change their behavior. So they'll stop riding the bus, they drop out of sport, they will have their parents drop them off 30 seconds before the first bell rings. Uh, all in, they're trying to change the, the likelihood of it being repeated. So then we said, has a high likelihood knowing that victims change their behavior. And we felt it was important to really understand that this type of behavior, um, really calling upon some of Sandra Graham's work and others, Jana Yehovenen, of that the victims do feel intimidated, demeaned, or humiliated as a result of the aggression. What, for some of the, that you study bullying, you notice that we don't um, necessarily uh, talk about intentionality. So there's a great debate and Scotland has now taken intentionality out of their definition because they feel like teachers and administrators, because kids will say JK, just joking, that there's no way for them to assess the, the true intentionality, that they want to look at the behavioral outcome. Um, so lots of debates about that. There's a lot of text on this slide, but this is largely just if you come back to this. So Michelle Yabara um, and Kim Mitchell, um, my colleagues, um, they happen to have data sets where and data collections going on in 2008 and 2010, where we could go in and manipulate this definition um, and see if these dynamics made a difference. And um, when there was, and I'll just summarize this. So as the aggression became um, much more where there was an obvious power differential and there was repetition, there were higher rates of daily interference. Um, and so the highest rates of interference with daily functioning were observed when um, the victims felt a differential power and a repetition had been going on for a really long time. And when the kids felt like they could not defend themselves, we also had the highest level of helplessness. Um, in this study too, um, we found that youth were victims of online generalized peer aggression or both online generalized peer aggression and cyberbullying, but cyberbullying rarely happened alone. Um, so we're going to talk more about that connection in another debate. Like we have hundreds of debates in the area of bullying. And hopefully I'm giving students some ideas for um, some master's thesis or dissertation or grant proposals. I'll just give you some, some sense of um, the numbers here. These numbers are pretty consistent. Now, we don't know what we just collected data from some third through fifth graders in North Dakota because they're in school right now. And... Um, we're not sure what these rates are going to look like. We're not sure what they're looking like now in the pandemic, although anecdotal evidence would say that it's happening even in Zoom and um, Google Classrooms. And we don't know what it's going to be like when they come back. And, and certainly SRCD is talking about where they've added a lot of these data to ongoing data collections. But pre-pandemic, we in a number of studies, and we replicated this in 2018 as well, 15% of kids are chronically victimized. And so this is not in a lifetime. This is a high rate in the last 30 days where it was happening repeatedly. 17% are kind of your kids that are running these groups that are engaging in this high rates of bullying towards others. The bully victims is the 8% consistently, whether it's Sue Swear's work or David Schwartz's classic work. Um, shows that this particular group where they've been victimized and they're aggressive as well, 
um, have the highest rates of mental health challenges. Um, so if anybody's out there in the field um, working clinically one-on-one -on -one with kids, these are often the kids that you see um, referred for mental health services. Unfortunately, overrepresented in our suicidal ideation attempts as well. Now, um, we have for a really long time in the developmental science literature recognize that there's bystanders. What we have not done is leveraged um, the power of the bystander as much as we should. And I can talk more about that, but that's a whole nother area. So we have, you know, bystander revolution and we have to encourage the bystanders. This is very complex. Um, and I'll hint at this later that it's not as simple as telling kids to intervene and help when we um, did some focus groups a couple years ago to develop a text messaging program. Um, we did focus groups online several years ago, and there were uh, many middle, middle school students that were very open in why they would not intervene. Um, and things like they didn't know the victim, it's none of their business, they felt the victim deserved it. And so it's not as simple as you should just do the right thing. They would also say the adults don't intervene, why should I have to intervene, those types of things. Um, but we, when we look at these bystanders, as I'm alluding to, only 13% actually say that they intervened to help the victim. So, and that varies depending on developmental stage and the climate of the school, the complexity and that context matters. Now, when we think about definitional issues around cyberbullying, there's a great debate about what that is too. Um, and we went down this road where we would just adapt to face-to-face -face definition um, and just see it as a mode. And I think that's where we're at now, but that could change. Um, and if anybody's really interested in this work, Hanjai and Patchen um, do some really good outreach, some good research. This is just, this is what they do with cyberbullying. Um, and there's, you know, with, with new platforms like Twitter um, and like TikTok, we're really trying to understand what we call the gray area, sarcasm, um, is that bullying, racism, hate speech, um, those types of things. We're not going to solve that problem in the next hour, but certainly um, lots of things to think about. Um, this is, this has continued to be replicated. The YRBS data um, hasn't come out yet for the off year. Um, but this, the message here is that face-to-face -face, pre pandemic uh, bullying victimization is uh, much higher than cyber bullying that we see. So when I had, why is this important? And I know Stephanie said Dorothy's has this eye toward um, translating this work. Uh, an example of how you how I use these data or when I'm talking to principals and they say, well, you know, we don't really have a face to face bullying problem here. It's all that social media um, and that cyber bullying. That's what I'm dealing with all the time. And what I try to get them to understand is one, the national data say, um, which is not the greatest measurement, but we don't have time for that either. Um, that the face to face bullying really is much more prevalent in that there is some importance of addressing that um, as we go forward. Sometimes that works. Other strategies that we've taken is to show them data that there is a really strong longitudinal link. Um, and this, we did these analyses really just to convince principals and superintendents and school boards to not put all their bullying prevention efforts into cyberbullying to recognize if they build a climate and culture such that bullying perpetration face to face is not tolerated um, and it's prevented and there's a positive school climate that they will see less of this mean and cruel behavior as kids engage with technology, which means less on their plate Monday morning when they have to deal with these things that happen online. And so this is just a longitudinal four uh, wave uh, panel data where we track kids from sixth grade to eighth grade. And we found the root re, the fit was 0.05 uh, for the RIMSIA. And um, this essentially shows this is a six month period that if you're engaging in high rates of bullying directed toward others face to face, um, that you take these behaviors online. So that's the kind of the perpetration to perpetration link. Um, but we were also hearing that um, there was also an association, those kids that were victimized at school might be retaliating if they have better computer skills or better social media skills. 
And we did, and here we found a cross leg model such that if I were victimized and they become a perpetrator online six months later, and then because um, this type of behavior is not anonymous, that most of the kids know who's going after them online, um, that then you're at risk for being victimized when you go back to school. And this is for many of us that have been in schools, we know as researchers and the teams uh, not to go into a school on a Monday morning, right? You're just going to sit in the office, even if you had an appointment, and because they're putting out fires from the weekend that is largely social media based, but it usually st started on Friday with some drama um, and it played out over the weekend such that th this is exactly what we're finding consistently in our research that these are not two different phenomena, they're actually phenomena that are linked. Um, and if, with the prevention eye, if we are able to reduce the face-to-face -face bullying within the classroom, we would hope that we're able to minimize that transfer into social media. Um, I'm going to start taking you through kind of a series of studies that my students and my colleagues have been trying to unpack. Um, but I think it's also important, um, and if anybody's read the work in, in the area of bullying, um, in the early 90s, Sue Swear and I wrote several books and um, started to conceptualize bullying as a phenomenon that could be understood through uh, Broffenbrenner's uh, social ecological uh, model and domains and context. And slowly, my students and I have been chipping away at the different contexts. And I'll show you some of that work, um, hopefully not too overwhelming. Um, with a particular focus um, on the schools, the peer and the family context, or at least the perceptions of the kids reporting on their family context. Um, and more recently, the interactions between this, because if you read the classic Uri's Broff and Brenner's work, which is brilliant, everybody should just read it all the time. Um, it's really the complex interactions across those domains. Um, and with the advent of more rigorous multi-level modeling and latent class, other types of strategies would be able to more consistently um, apply the socio-ecological framework. Also for us, um, because I've never seen bullying as a phenomenon that just kind of emerges that um, we can look at some of the developmental science around family violence um, and the transfer from one context home to the school. And so we have taken also a social interactional learning model where family violence serves or the lack of social emotional training within the context of a home serves as an important context for understanding the relationship between bullying and all of those kind of predictive factors involvement in anger and alcohol use and delinquency um, and the connections between bullying gender-based harassment sexual harassment and then teen dating violence and I'll show you a developmental model that we've been kind of chipping away at in our studies. It also became very, very obvious to us in 2000, my former student who's now a full professor, Paul Petit at Boston College, um, in early 2000, somehow convinced principals and superintendents that we needed to address homophobic name calling. Um, and I often, this is what's so unfortunate. This is just one hour because I'm kind of a storyteller too. And so, so many of my research ideas come from the kids. And I remember interviewing in Georgetown, Illinois, a seventh grader, and we interviewed, um, we we're just doing some qualitative work to see how others findings in Europe translated to the US context. We probably interviewed about 36 kids at this point, and this one really brave seventh grader is like, yeah, ma'am, I really appreciate these questions, but you're really not asking me about what bothers me every day. And he said, being called gay and a fag. And he said, I'm not even sure, you know, I'm not really even thinking about what I'm attracted to, and my friends do it to me, and then people that don't like do it to me. And Paul Petit then developed, um, and we looked at the literature, it wasn't surprising to us. Um, and we looked at the minority stress model as well. And Paul developed the homophobic content agent target scale, HCAT, and then we've continued to do work. It was also very, very obvious that gender and sexual minority youth in our schools, when we were allowed by IRB to ask such demographic questions, that their, their victimization was much higher, which we're gonna talk about too. So we also take this really gendered harassment lens and gendered focus lens 
increasingly we're going more to intersectionality to include race and inequity issues, but that's another talk as well. So I'm gonna, um, we had one of the uh, first kind of longitudinal studies um, that looked at different forms of bullying and concomitant forms of violence, but did it with a risk and protective framework drawing upon the socioecological model and this longitudinal data, so it's not nationally represented, that is a limitation. But what we get in this data set is really deep measurement. Um, and so you can have YRBS, that's surveillance data, um, one item indicators. Here we had 32 risk and protective factors across the socioecological framework. Um, and so this has really been helpful for us. We tracked kids um, from fifth and sixth grade all the way through high school with the support of CDC and NIJ. Um, and I've really been able to um, understand the ways in which bullying is connected to other forms of aggression, as well as some of the predictors, mediators, moderators. And so I'm going to just kind of walk you through some of the work that we were doing. Um, and so we had we had a certain administration that for eight years um, was not funding um, rape prevention in this country. And what was happening was the sexual assault coalitions in most of our states in the United States, uh, because they couldn't study rape unless it was an absence model, all sex ed was absence model, um, and they couldn't be funded for anything that would be more um, preventative beyond the absence model. There was not comprehensive sex ed at that time. What they were doing is they were using their funds to uh, give out grants for bullying prevention. And so I called the CDC and I was like, we got a problem here in Illinois. Uh, we have a sexual assault coalition and your rape prevention educators on the ground that are not doing rape prevention education, that they're actually doing bullying prevention. And what happened was we then wrote a white paper um, and then made an argument with successfully funded uh, to really answer the question, is bullying associated with sexual violence? What are the mediators, moderators? What are the malleable risk and you know risk factors? And how can we bolster these protective factors? So we have many, many papers, um, but I'm just going to give you some, um, some ideas. Now, back then, this was before latent class analysis when we started to do this study. Um, and I had a lot of pushback from not only the administration, but superintendents, parents, of why did I feel the need to address homophobic name calling? Because they don't really know what that means. And it's just, you know, that's so gay or you throw like a girl. None of that gender-based harassment really took hold or it wasn't that common. So we first would show school districts their data. So we did cluster analysis instead of latent class analysis. And when we did that, we showed that um, one, the gender discrepancy was not there. But it's another conversation. 12% um, of males and 12% of females um, were in this high bullying group cluster, if you will. But when we did the same type of analysis um, with homophobic name calling, we found that one out of three boys were engaging this in high rates, like on a daily basis, very, very high rates, like 60, like we probably, they ceilinged out on it. Um, and this was directing it toward others. And then females were participating. Now, this is not a surprise. If, if you study heteronormativity in schools, um, boys and girls maintain that traditional masculinity in the same way. Now, when we were doing this work, we were very in a binary gender space. Um, and so as we've become more progressive in our research and the, in the country, then we've had more nuances where we're looking at non-binary and transgender and other um, identities here but so I apologize for the younger folks to think is that how you measured it yeah and back in that day we couldn't ask transgender um, we did in this study attempt to measure sexual orientation of fifth and sixth graders um, at wave one but then uh, parents shut that down and we weren't at, able to ask longitudinally until we the kids got to high school just so you know I'm just giving you some social political context that's happening here. Um, we also get a lot of pushback from reviewers that how is homophobic name calling? It's just more names, it's just bullying. 
Um, and Todd Little was helpful enough to, I said, you know what, I just need to publish something that says that these are two distinct constructs. And essentially this shows that when you fit a two factor model of bullying and homophobic teasing, it fits better than putting them all together in one. Um, and so it's interesting. So you've got reviewers saying, what is this all about? Why would this be a different phenomenon than bullying? Isn't it just bullying? Um, and you notice that it's, it, we called it homophobic teasing, which we've gotten pushed back lately. So now we call it homopho homophobic name calling. And then we also on this side, we have parents that somehow if we ask kids about this language that they would start doing it. Um, and so this demonstrated that they're two distinct constructs. So, you know, some of the take home messages for some of this re research is that homophobic name calling is quite prevalent in middle school. It was prevalent pre pandemic. Um, it's, we saw an increase um, since 2016. Uh, both data have showed that there's an increase in homophobic name calling and sexual harassment. Dewey Pinnell has found some of this work in his Virginia um, School Safety Climate Surveys, which was published in Ed Research. So I encourage you to look at um, the bullying rates and other forms of gender-based harassment coming out of that lab. Um, and there is some hints that youth who bully actually resort to homophobic name calling over the middle school years. And I will have this until I retire on every slide probably that bullying prevention programs should include a discussion of language that marginalizes gender nonconforming and LGB youth. Um, they continue not to, that's a whole nother conversation. Um, if you are mass producing a commercialized bullying prevention program and you wanna sell it to everybody from Utah to Florida to progressive California, um, this tend not, tends not to be um, in, in the curriculum. So we did, uh, Catherine Basile and my colleagues at Centers for Disease Control started to, to talk about the bullying to sexual violence pathway. Um, and we do find in the middle school years that high involvement in bullying perpetration is associated with sexual harassment perpetration in late middle school. And we replicated in a recent paper last year through high school. And so that bullying sexual violence pathway, which we had a theoretical paper that outlined why it would be that there was a connection here held up in the data consistently over our studies. Um, we also found that that homophobic name calling, calling someone um, those homophobic epithets also is a precursor to sexual harassment perpetration. Now sexual harassment perpetration in middle school is largely unwanted sexual commentary, rumor spreading, some sexting. Um, smaller percentage, what we call contact, which would be closer to sexual assault and rape, um, are very low frequency behaviors, which is good. It's not zero, um, but very difficult to model statistically. And that's why if any of you are doing school-based work and you can ask the AUW sexual harassment items, that would be great because we need to integrate our data to answer some questions about rape and sexual assault that we're not able to do in these, these smaller studies. And, you know, this study is 3,600 kids, so it's not as if it's small, but because rape and sexual assault is so low base rate, it's hard to model that, and we end up just uh, lumping it together. So consistently, we've found strong longitudinal associations among bullying, homophobic bantering, and sexual harassment. Um, and for boys, you know, bullying and sexual violence seems to be moderated by homophobic name calling such that Kid boys that engage, again, binary sense um, of the word here, bullying in fifth and sixth grade and homophobic, so, and then sexual violence several years later really depends on homophobic name calling. Um, so if we can address the homophobic name calling, we might can disconnect that bullying to sexual violence pathway. It's not as easy to do that though, because the minute you're talking about homophobic name calling, parents and teachers think you're promoting something um, that you're not. And so we have a number of other kind of uh, analyses that are underway, some papers that are published that draw upon um, some of the great work there of understanding the moderators between bullying and sexual violence. Um, and traditional masculinity is, thank goodness we measured this in among those 32 risk and protective factors. And Plex work at University of Illinois dating back in the mid 1995 um, really did link 
this understanding of traditional masculinity as a, a form of gender, kind of leading to a form of gender-based harassment. Stacey Horn has done some brilliant work in Chicago on this as well. Um, drawing upon some of the early work by Van Risen and Pellegrini um, at Minnesota there and others, largely Canadians, have also shown that this need for social dominance, and I was, would also argue Patricia Hawley's work, who did largely some of this work with primates, um, but we draw upon in the aggression and world, um, is this idea that kids that have this need for social dominance to be that popular kid uh, it seems to moderate that association between bullying and sexual violence. Um, traditional masculinity uh, is quite malleable if we could get teachers to talk about flex multiple masculinity work. Um, some folks have taken it into toxic masculinity and there's great debate about that. Less so about what you do about social dominance, which may be really personality linked. Um, and some of the bystander work and other youth driven work is to find out who are those kids with high social capital and high social dominance needs. And can we steer them away from aggression toward or pro-social behaviors? Um, and then this dismissiveness seems to be, it makes sense that if you're engaged in bullying, that it escalates to sexual violence if you're dismissive of some of those precursors, whether that's the ways in which boys talk to girls, um, it's the ways that teachers view girls who um, dress a certain way that might be victims of sexual violence. And so these are kind of the additional moderators that we're um, attempting to, to measure and have found some support as moderators, as well as some mediators in some cases as well. But, so many of you know that if you're funded by Centers for Disease Control or NIH and others, that there's always been a shift on risk, a focus on risk, but there's been a real shift on trying to understand how to build protective factors in communities, whether that's schools and families, neighborhoods. Um, and so we, again, because we had protective factor framework when we designed this longitudinal study, um, we're finding great support for the protective factor of school sense of belonging. And I use the good now reduced scale, that's four items. And it seems as if it just is so protective at all levels, at the individual level for some kids that are at risk for victimization or perpetration. Um, so more and more the work that I've done with Jonathan Cohen out of the School Climate Center and Stuart Tremlow and Marvin Berkowitz, who's the character education, this idea that we need to think about bullying as a school improvement process, that if we attend to the connectedness of teachers and students and students to students, it seems as if there's less bullying, there's less sexual violence. Um, and interestingly, uh, we also find that empathy, parental monitoring, and social support also play some very critical protective factors um, with some varying results, but I'll give you an example. What we've done is we've looked at trajectory, say, of empathy of our sample from fifth grade to 11th grade. And when we do late in class with that, you, um, for example, you find a group that's really low in empathy in middle school and never really goes up. And what it looks as if the, some of the papers we've published is that those kids that have low empathy um, in early middle school, that does not increase because we've got another group that's low, but then they seem to recover over time. But the one that stays low, um, or they are actually more likely when we go to predict the classes, more likely to be sexual violence perpetrators and teen dating violence perpetrators six years later. So it's kind of fascinating to think about all the work we do in social emotional learning where we're trying to get kids to empathize, empathize uh, around others um, and is probably the reason why we're seeing some reductions in gender-based harassment with social emotional learning programming, which we'll talk a little bit more about. Um, we have, at this point, we were studying um, parental monitoring. It was before the parental disclosure kind of data came out. Um, so we just really have this more instrumental monitoring that's happening and it seems to uh, moderate the association between bullying and sexual violence. Um, as well as social support, um, depending on the level of social support uh, there as well. 
So uh, hopefully what I've highlighted in this part of the talk, um, and we'll start moving a little faster here, is a need for a comprehensive approach that addresses the climate um, that lends itself to bullying, uh, to sexual violence, to gender-based harassment. Um, and I, I do really want to point out that the homophobic name calling is much more prevalent in middle schools than the garden variety, which I don't even like to say, but it is. And we know that LGBT um, and gender and sexual minority youth experiences at high rates. We can no longer think we're going to reduce bullying if we do not address and counteract the perceptions of gender nonconformity and the risk that gender and sexual minority youth encounter in our schools. So I was alluding to this developmental model as a young assistant professor, I was quite obsessed with Malamu's confluence model of sexual aggression. And for the last 20 years, I've been chipping away at this association. So we have some papers that have implicated child abuse and domestic violence, family conflict and sibling aggression, which um, is really based on some of Thornberry's classic developmental studies on family conflict. Sibling aggression is a quite a strong predictor of family um, conflict and bullying over time. Uh, bullying, as I've said, to sexual harassment. And um, we also then found an association in our NIJ study in the high school years of sexual harassment predicting teen dating violence. Um, and so that developmental model is one that we've been working on for a really long time and hopeful to eventually look at more emerging adults after high school um, but that requires funding and kids being in school. Um, I have some slides here. If anyone has followed uh, my work or my students' work, we were some of the first, along with Stephen Russell and Glisten, um, to really highlight that peer victimization, uh, more recently dating violence and mental health issues um, are a cause for concern among gender and sexual minority use. So we have lots of papers on this. We do draw upon the minority stress and mental health model um, and, and more recently some intersectionality work because we do look at gender sexual minority youth who identify as an ethnic minority or identify as having a disability. Um, and so this has really been our framing. Uh, we have consistently over the last now, wow, it's been 15 years, a um, number of my uh, former students have been really trying to advocate for gender and sexual minority youth research. Uh, Paul Petit, my former student, has a wonderful NIH grant on the importance of gay and straight alliances. Um, so lots of papers on that. If I mention anything that you need, I can introduce you to these people or send you papers as well. Um, 2011, remember we said that was a good year. It continued to be a good year. This was the first paper published in Educational Researcher on gender and sexual minority experience, youth experience uh, in schools related to victimization. Um, and we did find that they had high rates of victimization and bullying, high rates of suicide thoughts and attempts, um, and higher levels of unexcused absences. So we're concerned about gender and sexual minority youth being pushed out of schools or being pushed into alternative school settings, which then compromises their career trajectory. Um, I do wanna point out though, that sometimes my research was used against um, the, us, I guess, in some ways, that uh, not all gender and sexual minority youth in our sample uh, experience these things. It's when they experience it that we know that one suicide attempt places you at risk for an additional attempt. Um, so when there is a risk profile, they're pretty elevated. Um, but there are some kids that are doing okay, that have family that's, that are affirming, that may be out at school and they're supportive. Um, but we are still concerned, the recent data of YRBS, which we did a commentary um, in pediatrics, although it seems as if some suicidal ideation and attempts are going down nationally, that is not the case for gender and sexual minority youth. And if you look at that data, we have a huge jump in kids identifying as bisexual, um, which we're trying to make sense of that as well, but they also have elevated risks of suicidal ideation or attempts. 
So this is a the work is not done in this area. In some ways, we've backtracked because of the, the lack of guidance or pulling back the guidance um, from the Department of Education. Um, but there's always the future. Uh, my former student students, I would say at this point, Tyler Hatchell and Joey Marin. Um, you know, Tyler Hatchell has an eye toward prevention and intervention and has started to look at protective factors as well, and found here that school sense of belonging was the most profound predictor against saying that we really need to think about school connectedness and belonging for kids, which makes me sad sometimes to think that so many of these kids do not have that experience right now. Um, and then when they do go back to school, uh, really cultivating uh, a sense of community and belonging um, through these associations and inclusiveness is going to be so important. So over lots of studies and over the years that, you know, we do find support for minority stress theory uh, for gender and sexual minority youth. They do report higher rates of peer victimization and mental health challenges, even teen dating violence. So there's only six papers written on teen dating violence among gender and sexual minority youth. So I encourage anybody looking for something that's not um, studied in the developmental literature. This is important. Um, and so it's a really complex as victimization. We know that the victim, even if you, in some of our papers, when we have done statistical analyses to control for victimization, as if we could just control for it, there was still disparities. So even if we have 100% reduction of victimization, which by this, we're only at like 20% in an ideal situation, um, this will continue to be a problem because of community and family and religion and those types of, and society in general. Um, and the stigma associated um, with those identities. Um, lots of literature on the socioecological perspective and many of you that are prevention scientists know this model very well. We've applied it broadly. Um, Andy Horn, who's the author of Bully Busters, you know, we started writing about this in the early 2000s um, and I'm gonna start flipping through some of these. For the longest time, we mostly had cross-sectional studies um, or nationally representative cross-sectional studies. Most of our ongoing NIH longitudinal studies did measure bullying. Um, they have now added some of this or didn't measure other types of things. So the meta-analysis are very important um, to understand bullying and the connection with these other individual correlates like depression, empathy, Impulsivity um, seems to be quite a potent predictor in most of our data sets. There's something about the lack of emotion regulation that seems to trigger some forms of conflict and violence that we see. Um, and so we're also very concerned about kids that are chronically victimized in middle school being at risk for early initiation of alcohol and drug use. And so Jennifer Livingston at, at Buffalo now in the nursing department there is funded by NIH and doing some really cool daily diary data and showing that on those days that they're victimized, they're more at risk for substance use. And it varies by cigarette as if you study this. So I encourage you to uh, reach out to her, reach out to me to get to her. I'm just very interested in that. And because of the focus at NIMH and NIDA, a crossover effects of our prevention programs, I think we're gonna see increasingly us being asked like, yes, you have the bullying outcomes, but do you have alcohol and drug too? Because there could be these crossover effects that we see. Um, some really wonderful work, Amanda Nickerson at Buffalo has done this meta-analysis and has shown, it's great debate about empathy. Can you teach that? What does the research look like? Um, it seems that the relationship with bullying behaviors indicated there is a support for the association of low levels of empathy and bullying, but affective empathy seems to be uh, both in Nickerson's meta-analysis as well as um, Van Norden's in the Netherlands, affective empathy seems to show up more than cognitive. So I can kind of know cognitively what's happening with someone, but affectively that's where we want to, where we see the higher reductions of bullying, if you will. Amanda's also linked this to defending behavior. Um, her and her colleagues Jenkins, um, school psychologists that are doing great work in this area. There's other literature. Salma bali has been looking at attitudes supportive of this behavior. That was one of the strongest predictors in my first papers in, in 1998. 
when kids felt that bullying was a cool kind of thing to do, um, they would do it. Uh, this one I always, I, we're engaged in so many meta analysis and it's so much fun because it really does summarize a body of literature. Um, and this essentially says this, this is a cross-sectional meta-analysis um, and it shows that kids that are popular um, in middle school tend to be overrepresented in the bullying groups. Um, in elementary school, if you're a bully, the peer group kind of takes care of it, that you're, you're not going to, you're going to be rejected from that peer group. So really, when we think about doing prevention programming in K through five, it's a different beast, if you will. Um, the peer group sometimes will reject those aggressive kids. Once they get to middle school, the kids that engage in high rates of bullying, um, remembering the heterogeneity, uh, tend to be those that have high social capital that kids want to be friends with, not necessarily that they like, right? So us developmental people, we like to think about, well, is it preference? Is it likability? No, they wanna be friends with this popular kid because this kid comes with social capital and maybe protection around victimization. Message is, do not dump K through five programming into middle school and think that that's going to be effective when in fact the ideological predictors underlying that phenomenon is different over time. So we've also done a lot of social network um, studies with really brilliant social network analysts um, at RAND, like Joan Tucker and Harold Green, and more recently, Kelly Rollison um, at Penn State, which you're lucky to get her, uh, and have looked at bullying perpetration before even Sienna came around, um, some uh, Nicopee and UCI Net, naming all these programs I used as an assistant professor when I thought I would do some social network analysis. Um, and we found support for selection and socialization for bullying, homo homophobic name calling, as well as a willingness to intervene um, and bystander intervention. There is a socialization process, which really points to um, our intervention programs need to be directed at the peer group, at the peer group level. This was a meta-analysis um, that we've just kind of replicated, but with cyberbullying by standard intervention outcomes that's under review at School Psych Review. But this was a meta-analysis, Josh Polanin, who now works for AIR, my former undergrad, that's a super powerful meta-analysis at AIR, um, and found that the effect sizes for this high school program, Build Respect, was 0.46 for increasing bystander intervention. So I encourage you to look at this. This is very strongly into the theory of change, like Prochaska and Norcross's theory of this pre-contemplation contemplation. Um, because kids do think about intervening, there is a decision tree um, for who they will and what it looks like. And if their intervention fails and there's retaliation, they'll be less likely to do it again. Lots of literature on family and school. Um, a healthy family looks like a healthy school and an unhealthy family looks like an unhealthy school. I encourage you to, to look at that reviews uh, over those reviews. We've started to also really draw upon heavily some of David Finkelhor's work around poly victimization um, because we want to know that if there's kids coming to school with you know high family and sibling aggression, victimization or perpetration, um, that they might respond differently to our prevention programs. Increasingly, we're finding in some of the trials, as well as many of you are finding, that the prevention um, and interventions that we do may be particularly more effective with kids that come in with a different type of presentation. And it's not clear that if our prevention programs address this poly victimization group. Uh, my colleagues here at Florida when I was here have done some great work around parental monitoring and bullying um, that I encourage you to look at. I had a student here at Florida as well that um, did a great meta-analysis looking at parental components and found effect sizes of 0.18 um, and also found that for the majority of the studies, most of these studies are outside of the United States. Um, and so they've done much more work of involving parents in bullying prevention than we have in this country. There was only 22 studies and this was published last year in uh, 2019. And this was related to perpetration and then we had victimization. Again, another paper I can send you, the majority with the exception of a few here have been in Australia and Canada. I'm just looking at the names 
of all the people from more Canada and some Finland, um, they're way ahead of us. Um, okay, I'm checking my time, it's 4.32. Okay, um, here is the, some of the stuff that I was hinting at of interactions. And again, I can send you this paper. Story for this particular paper was, even if I come from a really dysfunctional family, um, but I'm going to a high connected school. So um, kind of if you look at the top line uh, to the left, high school connectedness, but high dysfunctional family, um, my bullying perpetration is lower that if I come from this dysfunctional family, I go into this chaotic school that has low connectedness, my bullying perpetration is gonna be the highest. Just so you know, we have a major Floridian storm going on and I'm hoping we don't use any electricity. I'm a little distracted by that. Um, okay, I'm gonna take about five more minutes and then we'll take questions. Um, this was also a very interesting meta-analysis. I remember calling David Yeager, uh, Professor Yeager, and some of you may know he was a Carol Dweck student. He does brilliant work, even separate from Dweck. But he was in the field doing trials. I was doing trials in middle schools and we were noticing that the the kids as they went from sixth to seventh to eighth grade, which is not surprising if anybody studies middle school kids, but the engagement with the social emotional learning program was going down. And he's like, well, let's do a meta-analysis. And essentially these are effect sizes plotted from first to 12th grade, um, where we find an effect size of 0.2 for first graders um, on average. And then it drops. And uh, we've got a few studies with the iatrogenic effects there in the corner. Um, and we just felt in the paper that we wrote up, we actually encouraged um, districts and school boards to stop doing what they were doing because they were mandating prevention programming K through 12. When we really didn't have a good handle on how, what it should look like for middle school and high school students. Um, and so another paper uh, that's important. There's been some great work, we've done it. Mark Hotzenbuehler has done some great work. Um, Stephen Russell's done some great work that shows that uh, we can have all this stuff, good stuff in place, but if there's not good policies and procedures uh, in place, a lot of this is not gonna stick in bullying prevention. And so um, again, we can share what's important. A lot of people will say, well, we'll have a policy, but it doesn't really make a difference. Well, no, that policy needs to be tracked. It needs to be consistently implemented and there needs to be some compliance associated with it. Um, and when there is, and it's consistent, then we seem to have, at least in the YRBS, less victimization and bullying over time when policies and procedures are followed consistently and they're transparent and everybody knows about them. Um, we've also published a few papers looking at the school level that predicts, and we find that um, with our, when we look and ask teachers and educators of what's happening in the school and then we survey the kids, uh, we find that um, when the teachers and educators feel that they're supported by the administration to go after bullying prevention, to go and be trained in domains, kids actually um, bully less, they're victimized less and they fight less. Uh, when teachers feel that there's an aggression problem in the school, kids will not intervene. So the teachers are saying, this is an aggressive place. And the kids are like, I'm not even going to try to get in the mix of this. And so we've shown that the multi-level really does matter um, over time. I think, um, I think you probably picked up on this important that I take this gendered lens. And uh, we asked them about their compliance with Title IX around sexual harassment, the, the ways in which they approach equity related to gender. Do they tolerate sexual harassment? Are they dismissive of sexual harassment? And we find that when the teachers say that they're intolerant of it and they follow Title IX procedures, kids bully less and they victimize less. Um, we also found that they engage in less homophobic name calling um, and are less likely to be targets of that. So that's kind of like full circle for me when I think about bullying and sexual violence and the need for the culture and climate. There's gonna be some slides on here. Um, I'm gonna start just going through, but you'll get the slide deck. Uh, Tef Tofty and Farrington just updated their meta-analysis. Um, in the best case scenario, we're reducing bullying by 17 to 20%. 
Um, and this is for victimization, what you need to include. These studies have consistently shown do not mediate bullying. Um, of course, Sue Swear and I were talking about that 17 years ago, um, despite the fact that some school districts are quite proud of peer mediation with bullying programs that they have. Perpetration, you need all of this. And if you're situated in North America, you're gonna have lower effect size, lower reductions, lots to do in the area of bullying. Um, and really where we've gone, and I think, you know, even Penn State has paved the way, if you will, the PATHS program, um, is to real, really understand that it's not about just addressing bullying, but it's about addressing the risk and protective factors associated with this one form of aggression that is co-occurs with other types of issues. Um, and Sherry Hamby had a great, and John Gresh had a great monograph on just breaking down the silos. So people say, well, I don't study sexual violence. I study bullying. I'm like, well, if you're in middle school, you probably should study sexual violence. And so breaking down those silos and, and really talking to one another. So SEL, which everyone knows um, what this is now. I did not have time to update this, but just so you know, Castle updated their definition even last week. Um, and so there's much more focus on equity, although I encourage you to still call it transformative SEL or equity focused SEL, because I think it's going to get lost in the definition for the average person that's not consumed by SEL. This is the Derlach meta-analysis in 2011 that showed that SEL is a good thing. Um, they've updated this since 2017 and also extended it to pro-social behaviors. Um, and certainly we can look at Terry Moffitt's work and Stephanie Jones, who's written extensively in this area, some of the most brilliant work around social emotional learning skills. There's definitely a link with social emotional learning competencies and longitudinal outcomes into adulthood. We have conducted um, an evaluation of second step. This is our first, this was our first trial. Um, and I want to take a three year trial and summarize this. So this is a randomized clinical trial evaluating the middle school program second step, which they no longer use. They've gone more online, um, but the same tenants, the same kind of scope, if you will. Um, and we had about 3,600 kids across uh, 36 schools in Illinois and Kansas, and this was a nested cohort design. So we tracked these kids across three years, uh, randomly assigned 18 to second step, 18 business as usual for bullying prevention, which usually doesn't mean much. Um, and what did we find in the middle school? We actually found reductions of physical aggression, bullying, cyberbullying, homophobic name calling, and sexual harassment. Um, we had uh, state differences in that it appears as if um, Illinois fared a little better than Kansas, Kansas being more conservative where we were in Wichita in, in the second year of implementation. And that's when we introduced gender-based harassment and homophobic name calling. However, when we did a meta-analysis of the implementation data, um, the effect sizes were very equivalent across the two states. So implementation, the fidelity seemed to be very, very important. If anybody's done this work, you know that that's to be true. We were able to track these kids into high school um, and found a mediating effect that those kids in second step intervention schools had an increase in school connectedness. There it is again, school belonging, school connectedness. And this was associated with a decrease and not just bullying perpetration, but other forms of perpetration into high school. So six years that we tracked these kids over time. We also were able to convince the district to um, allow us to look at students with disabilities. And we found a nice prevention effect in that bullying prevention, bullying perpetration went down slightly intervention and went up in the controls across the middle school years. And so, you know, prevention programs, I'll just conclude here and then I'm gonna just show you some exciting things for just one minute. Um, prevention programs yield reductions in bullying and victimization and gender-based aggression when implemented with fidelity, with supports. Um, the effects seem to be strongest among elementary school children and diminish as they go through middle school um, and high school, with the exception that bystander intervention seems to be more effective in the later years. More on that later. Um, we're recognizing the perceptions of staff matter and pull this all together since 2011. I feel like I've just been on this mission of trying to bring science back into the K through 12 settings to offset. I feel like there's like a tug of war with all the commercializations and 
school boards buying things that are simply not going to be effective with US schools. Um, and so I just wanna give you some pictures here of what we've been up to. Um, we were leveraging technology pre-pandemic, but it turns out as if, you know, um, people are now interested in how you do bullying prevention with technology. Um, we've started to involve youth in our studies, uh, really understanding that peer dynamic. So we've done a lot of focus groups to understand how we can address school violence when, when the kids actually have knowledge of what's happening and they know who the bullies are and they know what's contributing to this. So I encourage you to read through this. This was funded by NIJ and the Comprehensive School Safety Initiative prior to it being cut by this administration. Um, they were, we have quotes, we have papers, Kids, as much as the bystander intervention, we want to promote that. They're concerned about snitching. We have a snitching paper under review if anyone's interested. They're very concerned about racism and equities and fairness. And so we're trying to, um, to understand that as well. We work with high school students to uh, create a reporting app where they could report positive and negative things, but also um, could celebrate successes. They came up with the logo. This is a reporting app that's not anonymous but confidential. We uh, partnered with Google VR to do some virtual reality and um, pilot uh, with middle school kids and found an increase in empathy in the intervention versus control, which is really cool. The kids love the VR. They didn't necessarily like the curriculum that went with the VR, more on that. So there they are. Um, and then uh, we just got a good score on an R21 to further develop in our Bully Down social emotional learning app for seventh graders. Um, and th that's exciting. Um, with the work with Kelly Rollison, um, we're evaluating sources of strength, which is a peer leader program um, for sexual violence outcomes. And then we are also uh, really trying to do some work with school police and SROs. Um, uh, and giving the defunding focus on school police is going to be more important if you keep police in schools for them to be trained in trauma, social emotional learning, restorative justice and cultural competence. And so we're also uh, following some of the work of Anne Gregory and trying to uh, promote not punitive but restorative problem solving approaches in schools. And so hopefully that was not too much for you. Um, as we're going into either the same administration or a different administration, uh, Congress is asking us to address school safety issues um, as we speak. And so there has been the sense of really hardening our schools versus doing what we know is best and promoting school connectedness and well-being and social emotional competencies. Um, hopefully there will be a shift in that understanding too. Uh, we do need to involve youth. And I, I think that some people will say, oh, high school students can get involved, but what do middle school students know? Middle school students have a lot to offer us in understanding school safety, not just physical safety, but emotional safety, social justice, equity, and inclusion. And then all the adults that interact with kids um, really need to have a trauma-informed lens, uh, be open to restorative approaches, I think with the pandemic, uh, there's been an increase in recognition of the importance of social emotional learning and well being. Um, and then I think with um, a notion, you know, of the racial inequities in our schools and in our communities and our history, uh, really an eye toward cultural competence. Um, and so I look forward to any questions that you have. Thank you very much. Was, Thank you so much. That was great. I went over. Sorry. No. There uh, are 70 people clapping at home. You just can't hear them. <laughs> so Dorothy, thank you so much for that wonderful talk. I mean, the volume of the work was just amazing. It's so programmatic and yet comprehensive at the same time. It's just a very impressive review of that work. Um, I just wanted to open it up for folks that may have questions. And um, I think it will be, the folks will need to type that into the chat window and have me read it off. So we'll kind of give you a minute to catch your breath <laughs> and folks a minute to kind of collect their thoughts as they plug those in the chat window. <laughs> it was so clear. <laughs> there, it is a lot to process. Um, as, as folks are, um, 
I, if you don't mind, I'll throw a question at you. I guess it's- I don't mind. My own. <laughs> you know, I'm just so interested in, in those, these multiple levels of you know, this contextual model, thinking about these bullying concerns as kind of diffusing it away from an individual's actions and thinking more about this as a context where there's a problem and that this behavior may be symptomatic of groups and you know, the context. I, I'm super curious to know how that messaging is received and where you see the most um, openness to change as a, you know, like what, I'm, I'm curious from all of your experience, is it, are, 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 are you getting more movement on schools promoting connect, like school connectedness or empowering teachers to be more proactive or is it more around these curricula for the students to develop, foster empathy and, and self-regulation? Yeah, that's a, a good question. Um, I think with really effective administrators and principals, they get that school connected piece. They get that it's about relationships. Um, and I, I think there's a lot of them do. Uh, some of them are just so overwhelmed by um, you know, what they have to manage in a day that they want to be able to check off for the school board that they did something. And that's why that over-reliance on school assemblies um, pre-pandemic. Um, I still feel, and again, the context is so different now with the pandemic, but I'm thinking prior to that, um, that there's teachers and administrators come to my training hoping that they're going to really get the silver bullet, right? Or you're going to teach me because somehow we've got this figured out. And in, in some ways, I feel frustrated that I have to say under ideal situations, you're only going to reduce this behavior by 17 to 20% right? Like that is real. And so that's really a hard pill to take because I'm saying, okay, you got to do all of these things, but you're only going to get 20% reduction, which by the way, if you scale that up in a public health, that is, that's great. But if it's my school and I still have, you know, so that's frustrating, but at some point there's also a validation by the end of a day when I've worked with somebody for this group for eight hours, they're like, okay, so you don't really have it figured out. And we're doing this, this, and this, which seems to be supported by your research, right? Building community, addressing, you know, parent involvement, all of that stuff. So in some days they're validated if they're doing that work. Um, it is just really a, a challenge. It's, um, yeah, there's, but I think it rests with, and Ron Astor wrote this paper, I don't know, 20 years ago, that a lot of our prevention efforts really rest with that leader, and that's that principal, right, um, and how they set the tone, and so that paper, I continue to cite that that's just, and we all know it, how many of us have been in a school where you're rocking it out for years with a particular principal, that principal leaves, somebody comes, he's like, ah, see you later, we don't need you here, like, so it really, really is tough. Um, I think the social network stuff um, and the group phenomenon, the homophily, is largely understood um, by teachers and administrators that really just get kids and they get clicks and they find it. So they're like, yeah, no duh. Um, but the prevention side of that, we haven't matched the prevention strategies close enough. We're starting to do it. We're starting to do it. Um, okay, there's lots of questions now, Greg. We're starting mm -hmm. to filter in. So we have one uh, from Sydney. For teachers who already struggle to recognize bullying and now deal with the added stressors of COVID-19 and may struggle in identifying bullying remotely, what would be your best advice in prevention and intervention efforts? Yeah, million, another brilliant question. And, and so, okay, so let's just think about this. I don't think there's a lot of bullying prevention going on um, in these remote classrooms. Although I have to say some teachers in social studies and civics um, are starting to integrate some respect and kindness um, into some of the academic exercises that kids are doing so that they're having a conversation about kindness and respect or equity, but doing it through um, assignments, uh, which I think is the best way to do it. 
to be honest, we have no idea how to build climate and culture in a Google Classroom. We don't know how to do it within faculty meetings, right? We say, oh, record the faculty meeting. They're more likely to be, you know, so the, the research is catching up. Like, say you're going to record it because they'll, they'll behave, they'll show up. Um, and so I, I think that's asking a lot of a teacher to try to teach a classroom of third and fourth, fifth graders, sixth and seventh graders, and be able to detect bullying. It's kind of like asking the, right, the bus driver. We used to ask the bus driver to identify bullying on the bus. That is what it feels like to me, but that's not grounded in any science at all. And so what I am really looking forward to is when we can come back together in person and have panels at our societies with teachers that did this work, right? And, and because what I'm hearing from my ed policy colleagues and others that they're just like, we don't know what to do. They're not even studying some of the ed policy because they don't know what to do. What are they doing in teacher education? Um, how are we supervising student teachers out there through Zoom? What's that look like? I think there's a lot of questions, but I think we're expecting a lot of a teacher to manage all this, be peppy all the time with their kids get them to focus and all that. I don't know, it's a great question. Um, the fact that we haven't figured out bullying prevention pre-pandemic, whew, yeah, lots to do. Okay, yes. Okay. Damn it. Um, I'm gonna jump down to Diane uh, Felmley's question because I know you have time with Janet tomorrow, although maybe we'll even have time for her question today. Um, she writes, thank you for an excellent talk. Your research is always inspiring. And I found your discussion of homophobic name calling especially interesting. I do research with Bob Ferris on peer aggression. Recently, I've been studying online harassment and see evidence of a homophobic name calling as well. I wanna know whether you see evidence of students being rewarded in school settings by engaging in this behavior. Do others laugh or grant them attention or respect? Um, why are they doing this behavior, do you think? Yes. Oh, Diane, I followed your work and Bob is a good friend of mine. So I usually talk about you guys as social network hostile studies. I, didn't, I, I was remiss to do so. Anyway, um, yeah, so some of those papers, so Michelle Burkett, who's a former student of mine that's at Northwestern, um, did her dissertation uh, on social network analysis and found um, that uh, it was associated, homophobic name calling was kind of concentrated within friendship groups. So, and Joan Tucker's found that in some of our, our analyses as well. Um, and has found that there is a socialization process, right? So those kids that have more dense networks over time that engage in these behaviors, it seems to work for them. Um, but there's lots of more work that needs to be done to get to your question of do they laugh, attention and respect, right? So in social networks, we can only say that these are the characteristics of the peer groups and this is how this behavior kind of co-evolves with, with friendships. Um, we do know that the Tucker paper that looked at homophobic name calling among friends, even when it's among friends, it was linked to um, high rates of depression and anxiety, even when they, this was coming from their friendship groups. Um, this is great that you, there's not many of us that's one collecting homophobic name calling or gender-based harassment work online and doing peer network. So this is, this is great. Um, I hope you continue to do that and tell Bob I said hello. Um, 